afternoon. We are going to get started in just a few minutes. So we're gonna let folks join. Good afternoon and welcome to our event. I'm just gonna wait another minute or two while people are joining before we get started. Okay, good afternoon. I think we are about to get started. We're just uh, two minutes after one o'clock. Happy Climate Week to everyone participating and listening in. Uh, my name is Ann Reynolds. I'm with the Alliance for Clean Energy New York. We are one of four organizations hosting this um, webinar on offshore wind, ports, and job creation. So, um, first of all, I want to say hello and welcome to all of you participating um, here at the Alliance for Clean Energy New York, which is also the host organization for New York's Offshore Wind Alliance. We uh, are, have a sincere hope that uh, the offshore wind industry will be not only a, a source of carbon free power to power New York's future, but also will be a source of job creation economic revitalization in New York's communities. And that's why we wanted uh, this to be the topic for our Climate Week event this year. So in order to get us started, uh, I were first going to show a video and then I'm going to turn it over after the video to my colleague Uchenna Bright from Environmental Entrepreneurs. Um, and so this video is six minutes long and uh, is gonna set the stage for the discussion we're gonna have today. So let's go ahead and get started. Offshore wind is just getting started in the United States, although it has been going strong in Europe for 30 years. In fact, there are over 90 wind farms operating offshore in Europe. New York has adopted the most aggressive offshore wind target in the US. 9,000 megawatts. That's enough electricity to power 6 million homes. And we are off and running. New York has awarded contracts for five large-scale offshore wind projects, and the first should be producing power by 2023. When offshore wind turbines are built for New York, the turbines will be capturing the energy from steady winds in shallow waters far offshore, but still close to where many New Yorkers live, work, and need electricity. And to support the growing industry, New York will be building ports from Long Island to Albany to fabricate and assemble components and to ferry foundations, turbines, and workers to build and maintain the wind farms at sea. This investment will be matched three to one by private investment and will help revitalize some urban waterfront communities. The South Brooklyn Marine Terminal, for example, is targeted as a wind turbine staging and assembly port. We're estimating that both Empire Winds and Beacon Wind will bring approximately a thousand jobs annually into the community. And these jobs will span from engineer jobs, operations management, and um, as well as construction, of course. And they will create a, a ripple effect, mobilizing the economy in the area by the increase in sales. There are going to be more jobs in transportation, education, 
What's most exciting about it all is that from all of these activities happening in the Sunset Park community where over 50% of the population is low income, is that the community and environmental justice community will finally see the benefits from clean energy. It's been a community that has fought over the years to maintain the industry in the area. And it'll be great to see this community benefit from the addition of these high paying jobs. I'm here overlooking the South Brooklyn Marine Terminal, which plays a key role in the development of our offshore wind projects. Both Empire Wind and Beacon Wind will deliver over 30% of New York's climate targets. Um, and what we're looking at, it's something that represents something larger than just these projects. We're looking into the creation or the significance of a promise that has been made to the local, local community in bringing uh, jobs to the community, to an environmental justice area. We're looking into creating access for the future New York offshore wind developments that will take place in years to come. These projects will mean thousands of new family sustaining jobs and economic investment in communities surrounding the ports. Another example, South Albany, the future site of a foundation manufacturing facility. I'm Kathy Sheehan, mayor of the city of Albany. And for us, offshore wind means jobs, jobs for our residents, opportunities here at our port. We are so excited to be part of ensuring that we are doing all that we can to combat global climate change, to bring new technology, and to grow our economy. This is going to be great for the um, the city, the state, and the, I mean, and the county. It's just going to be an amazing project moving forward for everybody. I think the economy will grow from this. We will create a lot of jobs, uh, clean, renewable energy jobs. And we work with the Summer Youth Employment uh, Project, where my boss, Commissioner Jonathan Jones, gave me the free will to create a curriculum and work with our young people. Our objective is to expose young people to renewable energy because we truly, truly do believe it's the future. And a renewable energy moving forward in the future is gonna produce a lot of good jobs, clean jobs, clean energy in our communities. And we wanna be involved in this process. Offshore wind became the, uh, the future of renewable energy. We had uh, acquired new land. We positioned ourselves in a very proud and happy that we uh, received our first award for uh, tower manufacturing. Uh, we're pioneers as this is the first in the United States and uh, we feel that the future is just uh, unstoppable for us in, in job creation and uh, project development. Offshore wind is, is not a partisan issue at all. It has support across the board. Uh, governors up and down the East Coast and Democrats and Republicans alike. Uh, it has support from the environmental community, uh, support from the environmental justice community, labor unions. Uh, it is truly a win uh, for everyone. At ACE New York, we think Climate Week NYC, which this year is also American Clean Power Week, is a good time to recognize the opportunities for investment, development, and new jobs at ports, and for a more just and equitable energy system that is being created by New York's investment in the offshore wind industry. In New York, the new offshore wind industry is one of the ways we can build back better. Uh, so I want to first thank Ace New York for that stunning video. Um, I think it teases off really well for this uh, panel discussion and really, you know, clean energy and offshore wind is uh, the future uh, and uh, a win for everyone, uh, like um, was sort of stated at the end of the video. I, um, it's my honor today to welcome everybody to our program. My name is Euchana Bright. Uh, I'm the Northeast Advocate 
at E2, which stands for Environmental Entrepreneurs, as Anne mentioned. Um, and E2 is a national nonpartisan group of over 11,000 business leaders um, across the country, um, and they work in every state in the nation. And they come together to advocate for environmental policies at the state, uh, local, and federal level uh, for and environmental policies that are good for the economy and good for the environment. Um, so we are excited to welcome you to our four, what is now our fourth annual Climate Week event, jointly sponsored by ACE New York, Alliance for Clean Energy New York, um, New Yorkers for Clean Power, Natural Resources Defense Council, and E2. Each year, our organizations organize different topics, usually in person, but this will be our second year of having a remote Climate Week event, which actually in some ways has allowed us to reach a wider uh, audience and um, give them, uh, give wider access to our programming. Um, and this year's topic is offshore wind ports and job creation. And at E2, we talk a lot about um, the economic and job creation opportunities presented by the clean economy. Every year we release a report detailing the scope of clean energy jobs across the US as well as some state specific reports. And most recently on September 9th, we released a report detailing the lack of diversity, especially a lack of gender and ethnic diversity in the clean energy economy. And to find more, find out more about that report, just feel free to reach out to me or go to our website e2.org, that's e the number two.org. Now with this lack of diversity in mind, our report also shows that in December 2020, uh, there were over 3 million Americans working in clean energy, including 154,000 working in New York. In fact, New York has been a national leader on all things climate action. In 2019, with the passage of the Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act, or the CLCPA, New York not only set itself up with some of the most ambitious pollution and carbon reduction goals in the nation, we also committed our state to measurable, accountable, and intentional equity and inclusion in our action by creating the first of its kind climate justice working group in addition to, the to a just transition working group as advisors to the Climate Action Council. Now in our na nation leading efforts, um, offshore wind has been a quiet but building example of how we might live up to the commitments of the CLCPA. And as you saw in the video, the CLCPA also mandates 9,000 megawatts of offshore wind be installed by 2035 to help us meet our renewable electricity goals. So far, New York has taken steps towards this goal and that is what we're here to talk about more today. Um, offshore wind is setting an example for how to transition to a clean economy, making investments in a globally viable industry while creating local jobs in local communities and developing local supply chains to ensure the economic benefits of offshore wind are reaped in state. And because of the historic equity focus of the CLCPA, all of these actions are required to intentionally center equity, a definition and scope being outlined right now by the Climate Justice Working Group and the Climate Action Council. In addition to the climate and infrastructure investments, New York is establishing a variety of workforce training programs to meet local workforce needs and leveraging local institutions and community colleges to prepare trainees with the skills and assets needed to take advantage of the great paying jobs and the vast opportunity presented by clean energy and the clean economy transition. So to talk more about these jobs, the wind industry and port development in New York, I will pass it off to Nathaniel Green, Senior Policy Analyst at Natural Resources Defense Council, who is our moderator today. He will kick off today's discussion and introduce our panelists. Over to you, Nathaniel. Thank you so much, Eugenia. Um, and I'd invite all of our panelists to uh, turn on your videos now. Um, and thank you, Anne, for kicking us off. Uh, for those of you who don't know us, the Natural Resources Defense Council is an international nonprofit organization. We have over 3 million members and online activists. Uh, we were founded in 1970, and our lawyers, scientists, and other environmental specialists work to protect the world's natural resources, public health, and the environment. We have offices in New York, Washington, D.C., Los Angeles, San Francisco, Chicago, Bozeman, Montana, and Beijing. And I work on all things renewable at NRDC. I keep all of our renewables sort of coordinated across the country and at the federal level. 
and I co-lead our offshore wind work with my colleague, Ali Chase. Um, I'm gonna introduce our panelists now, uh, um, very exciting group of folks that we've got here today. Uh, I have a, a question that I've prepared for each of them, um, uh, but while I'm introducing them and while I'm asking them that first round of questions, I invite you all uh, to put your questions into the Q&A uh, um, function down at the bottom of the screen. Um, and, uh, and please let me know when you do if your question is directed at a specific panelist or for all of them. All right, kicking off our panel uh, is Summer Storm Sandoval. She is the Energy Democracy Coordinator for UPROADS. In this role, Summer leads many energy democracy campaigns, including developing Sunset Park Solar, New York's first community solar cooperative, fighting peaker power plants with the Peak Coalition, and, in, and implementing a local just transition through UPROSA's community-led comprehensive waterfront plan called the Green Resilient Industry District, GRID plan. Summer works with many partners to support policies and funding that will make renewable energy affordable, accessible, and community owned for environmental justice communities like Sunset Park. Willie White, you'll recognize as one of the stars of our video. Willie is a senior employment and training specialist for the Youth and Workforce Development Services Department for the City of Albany. He's a resident of the city's South End for over five decades and has worked to bring jobs and opportunity to the community. He is active in a variety of civic and cultural organizations and previously served as the executive director of Albany's My Brothers and Sisters Keeper Program. Alba Pena, you'll also recognize as one of our stars. Alba is in the community engagement manager, is the community engagement manager for Equinor Wind US. She's focused on stakeholder engagement for the Empire Wind Project in New York, specifically within the Brooklyn community. Alba's work spans from educating and engaging communities on Equinor's offshore wind developments to working with various institutions, including environmental, academic, and governmental institutions, and ensuring that across the organization, projects remain within the confines of responsible development. Alba joined Equinor in March of 2021 from the Boys and Girls Clubs of America, where she spent close to five years working in collaboration with external partners to execute our youth, um, their youth programs for underserved, underserved communities. Ross Gould, our finalist panelist, is the Vice President for Supply Chain Development at the Business Network for Offshore Wind. He joined the Business Network in 2020 and oversees the network's growth and evolution um, of the offshore wind supply chain, as well as the offshore wind industry's workforce development. Before following his passion for energy, Ross spent almost 10 years as an attorney in 20. 10, Ross became the Air and Energy Program Director at the Environmental Advocates of New York. In 2015, Ross joined the Worst Workforce Development Institute at WDI, where Ross focused on growing the workforce and supply chain of the offshore wind industry. Okay, I'm going to go in reverse order for questions now. So let's start with you, Ross, since we just introduced you. Uh, Many members of the uh, many member companies of the business network for offshore wind have experience working out of ports in Europe. How do you think that's going to translate to New York here? And what does New York State need to do for its ports to be ready? Great. Uh, thanks, Nathaniel. I appreciate it. Good afternoon to all of you, and, and thanks for, for tuning in today. Uh, first, I just quickly want to thank you, ACE New York, E2, NRDC, and, and New Yorkers for Clean Power for hosting this important and timely discussion, and for the invitation to be here with you all today. Um, the Business Network, we are the largest organization dedicated solely to building a robust offshore wind supply chain and expanding adoption of offshore wind energy. We advance the, the industry through collaboration, education, and in innovation. We, we inform, we educate, and we introduce people. And if you're interested, we have a number of educational tools, such as Offshore Wind 101 and Foundation to Blade, that are ways to help groups and individuals learn about the industry and on, importantly, to enter into the supply chain. Turning to your question, you know, as you heard in that video, the offshore wind industry, you know, it constructs and operates and maintains large energy infrastructure in a, in a marine environment. The finished components are extremely large and heavy and to coordinate and design, manufacture, construction, installation and operation of offshore wind projects requires a strong grasp of logistics. 
and a focus on logistics. The first offshore wind farm was built in 1991 and Europe has been doing this, this logistical dance for over 30 years. And so how does that translate to New York? Well, uh, you, know, you have five ports under development here for the industry. So you're gonna be doing a logistical dance as well. And so I say that all to say, look to Europe, look to what's already been done. You know, we offer our best practices as well as lessons learned, but that model must not be adopted you know, without taking a look at the conditions faced here. You know, New York City and New York State is, is different. You know, there are different communities surrounding the ports than you would find in, in, in European countries. So take, take a look at those differences, but also apply the best practices of what you learn. And then um, you know, make sure you're, you're doing community, reaching out to the community as part of the port development work. Great, thanks. Um, uh, and again, please put your questions uh, for the panelists into the Q&A uh, box. Alba, um, uh, turning to you, your company is obviously has a lot of experience in Europe developing offshore wind, but is new, new to New York. What lessons learned are you applying to port development here in the US? And what do you think is needed in terms of port development? Nathaniel, thank you firstly for the kind introductions. And I also want to thank Ace New York and partners for hosting this um, or facilitating this panel and, and hosting this uh, crucial conversation. And thank you for the audience for tuning in today. Uh, to answer your question, yes, Equinor is very new to New York. Uh, we have over 10 years of experience in the offshore wind business um, in Europe. But when it comes to a lot of the, the technicalities and the operations, those are relatively the same. What I would say is um, a, a takeaway would be the stakeholder relations front. We fully recognize the need to work with community and create this community-based model uh, in the communities that we go. And, and we have to essentially implement a, a, a different approach because all communities are different. Um, and we have to be cautious when we enter new markets, and, and that applies to the United States. New York, New York is a tough market, as we all know it. I'm a New Yorker. Um, there are a lot of expectations, but there's a lot of need uh, within those communities. So we have to not only collaborate with community, but also develop partnerships that that not only support our projects, but also are honest and transparent with us and what those needs are and what we're doing wrong. So I think. Um, uh, that would be the main takeaway from a developer's perspective is ensuring that we are engaging the community um, and establishing those strong partnerships along the way. In the sense of what we need for port development, uh, outside of, of, of those community relations, we, we do need the support from both, you know, the federal, state and city levels to ensure that a lot of, a lot of the projects that we're looking to move forward are prioritized. We understand that clean energy is important. And with the ambitions that the state has set in place, that pretty much has created the pathways for developers like Equinor to, to enter the industry in the, in the United States. Yes, great. Thank you. Um, uh, Willie, I want to turn to you next. Um, what are your hopes and expectations for how offshore wind will affect the South Albany community. Willie, we can't hear you. I think you're still muted. So the plight of the Zoom world, we all have to unmute ourselves. <laughs> okay. okay. All right, thank you, uh, uh, Nathaniel, for that question. Great question. Um, thank Ace for having me here today. One of the things that I really, really want to say is, and, and what my uh, purpose of being on this panel is to get the young people in my community involved in the offshore wind um, process here. Um, I don't want to be looking back 10 years from now and said, I didn't do anything to get our community involved in this process. Uh, it's gonna be a lot of great jobs. So having a strong relationship with the Port of Albany, with the city of Albany, especially our wonderful mayor, um, it's a win-win it's a situation here. I think um, that um, more people are learning about this in our community because we're getting the word out. I actually did a, a summer youth employment program this summer with uh, about 15 young people. We visited the Port of Albany, 
uh, what learned a lot about what was going on. And so, um, I mean, I'm on a trajectory upward. I'm really, really feeling uh, excited about this as long as the major players are not looking the other way, but getting our community involved in this. And my job, um, as I said in the video, um, my, my boss just said, go for it get our young people involved. Let's make this happen. Um, so I'm excited about this. I, I really truly am, especially with the jobs that we're gonna create in this process. Great. Um, I wanna come back and, and ask you more about sort of the specifics of, of what you think that opportunity looks like. But Summer, sure. I wanna to turn to you next uh, and just to round out this first set of questions and, and basically ask you the same question I asked Willie, which is, what, do you, what are your hopes and expectations for the offshore wind for the Uprose community? And, and how's it going so far? Thank you, Nathaniel. And it's great to be on this panel with this, with everyone. I wanna start off with sharing a little bit about um, who Uprose is and then go into our two main um, expectations for the, for the offshore wind development in New York City. So first, um, Uprose was founded in 1966. We're the oldest Latino community-based organization in Brooklyn. We're located in Sunset Park, Brooklyn, um, home to over 130,000. Um, we're environmental justice community. We're, um, today we're an intergenerational, uh, multiracial and women of color led organization. And we work at the intersection of climate change and racial justice. Um, so two, two of our main expectations for the offshore wind market is, is one that that's the development of offshore wind is a true opportunity to center equity and to address the historic legacies of environmental injustices. We're talking about a community that has three peak or power plants burning fuel oil and natural gas, polluting our air, um, all located within one mile of each other. Um, we're talking about a community that's been hit not only from storm after storm after storm, flooding, sea level rise, the COVID um, pandemic. Um, and so really seeing how we can use the offshore wind market creation as a vehicle to center equity and address this historic um, disparities. And then our second expectation is to create a different type of market. Um, we will require that offshore wind development and procurement is to work with community leadership from, from the on start. And because we're talking about the same community leadership that helped make the offshore wind market possible in, in New York City and New York State. Um, environmental justice community organizations like Uprose, like the New York City Environmental Justice Alliance, and many of the 200 organizations in New York Renews helped create and pass the Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act in 2019. And we, we worked hard and fought hard to ensure that there were equity mandates, particularly on how, how investments are made so that they move directly to environmental justice communities. Um, you know, we're, we're looking to operationalize a green reindustrialization of, of the waterfront. Sunset Park is located in the largest significant maritime industrial area in New York City. And we, we have the grid, we have, um, you know, which is the culmination of over a decade worth of community-based planning long before, um, you know, the state was talking about offshore wind, talking about green ports and talking about how we can use the industrial sector, a sector that historically polluted the community and do re uh, green reindustrialization to be creating well-paid jobs, creating renewable energy, um, and also a place for sustainable manufacturing and local production and being able to um, come at that in a comprehensive and community-led framework. Um, these are some of our top line expectations for how to really center equity in the offshore wind development in New York City. That's great. Um, uh, I actually I want to ask both you and, and Willie a, a, a follow-up question, which is what do you see as the as the sort of challenges that we face uh, sort of realizing the 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 benefits and the, the opportunities that you guys have, have laid out for us here? Um, what do you think are the, the sort of key next steps and, and challenges that we face? And and Summer, if you want to start and then Willie, I'd love to hear your thoughts as well. Yeah, absolutely. The biggest challenge is business as usual, um, and that we're we're just going to go from from a system that's big oil to big renewable energy, and that's not getting at the heart of the opportunity to center equity. And so we don't 
um, why we don't want to be boxed into benefits. You know, we want to be a part of meaningful decision making and leadership from from the beginning um, to to ensure that investments are made directly into the community and not to, um, not go not have a bunch of new revenue streams created to support the offshore wind market and for those investments to go to traditional stakeholders and that we really need to be focusing on on the on how to radically transform the process the process of decision making the process of procurement the process of development to to be able to um to center that community leadership and not and not box us into benefits and add us on um at the end um and to really create with us meaningful um, career pathways. So it's not enough to make to have um, jobs created, but those jobs need to be accessible to the local community. Um, and, to, and there's a lot of work and planning that needs to be done and to ensure that those well-paid jobs, the wide variety of diverse jobs that the offshore wind market will directly create and indirectly create are accessible to local environmental justice communities like Sunset Park and um, adjacent communities. Well, that's um, a great tea for you, Willie, because then you can also talk to me about the specifics. Like, what are you doing with the kids, the, the youth, to give them that, that career pathway? I, I just like to say ditto, Summer. Um, yeah, so um, we have training programs, uh, whereas um, we're preparing our youth for those jobs. Uh, historically, uh, we've been left behind and we cannot do that anymore. We have to be intentional, intentional about putting our young people um, and, and our community up front when it comes to some of these jobs. So there's, there's gotta be programs where that they can lead directly into some of those jobs. Um, we cannot drop the ball on this. Um, one of the challenges that, um, that I'm having specifically um, in the area of the port, we have a community of about four or 500 residents that live directly in ground zero next door to the port of Albany. We have to make their air clean. How do you do it in an industrialized area? Um, so my solution has always been, and I'll stick with this until the day I die, is that we have to move those residents out of that industrial area because we need that industrial area. But um, when you look at healthcare studies that we've did in the past, those people are literally suffering down there. So um, hopefully this will bring more attention to that fight that we've been fighting for several years. But, um, and I know that's not what we were talking about jobs today, but uh, that particular issue is more important to me um, than jobs, believe it or not, but we need the jobs to move forward. Uh, we need the port, we need the industrial area. So let's do something intentional to bring about jobs to our community with training programs. We, we have the mindset to do it. Do we have the resolve to do it is what I'm asking today. Great. Um, and, and actually, Alba and, and Ross, I, I want to open this question up to you guys as well, since, um, you know, you're on different, you know, both Alba very much concretely on the ground through, through your project, and Ross looking more broadly. Um, how do you, uh, um, how do you see achieving the, the sort of key uh, objectives there that, that Summer and, and Willie have laid out for us? How do we make sure that we're getting that job training, make sure that we're setting up those revenue streams that stay in the community? Um, what do you think? Yeah, no, of course. Um, so from, from our side, what we're working on is having those conversations early on with our community partners and, and stakeholders, consulting parties, developing strategies on how best to proceed with community benefits. Um, I mean, summer is... 100% right and saying that, you know, we, you don't want to be left towards the end of the consultation or just left with a, a chunk of money that is being invested in a community without a plan, without consulting with the community where, where to allocate those funds best that would benefit and create uh, positive outcomes and, and help the community grow alongside offshore wind. I think that's the ultimate goal here. Um, we are investing in a lot of areas. We are planning 
on investing in a lot of areas, but alongside that, we're creating the strategy so that these investments are done in a very community-led uh, way. Um, in terms of, of ensuring that the local community is benefiting from the job opportunities that these projects will produce, we are working to have conversations with our top tier suppliers to ensure that they are adapting and, and are, are being held accountable at the same level that Equinor is being accountable in the sense of ensuring that we're providing training, whether it's on the job or prior to the, to, to the jobs becoming available, ensuring that there's access to the community, uh, talking to local community organizations, because there's also, there all, there's, there's both access um, access barriers, but there's also language barriers, right? Where we can just assume that everyone has access to a computer and will be able to, to do trainings or have access to funds to, to join um, a specific training that an organization is holding. Um, we wanna make sure that the training is accessible. We wanna make sure that the local organizations understand what, what the job skills, what the, the certification components will be. Uh, so that we can prepare the local community way in advance before these jobs come into play so that they're, they're both trained and able to apply or are aware that these opportunities do exist. So that's something that we are, that we're working towards. And, and again, I, I always ask uh, various communities, individuals as when I'm on these panels to feel free to reach out and feel free to express your concerns and, and let's collaborate. This is the time that we can set the foundation and we can create that infrastructure and, and we can have not just Equinor, but future developers emulate um, a process that works for, for the community and, and, and the future workforce. Ross, do you wanna talk about it sort of at a higher level, more generally across the industry? Yeah, uh, but first I just wanted to, to, to build upon Willie's point about intentionality. I mean, you really do need to be intentional. We, are, we have an opportunity to create a whole new industry from the ground up. And if you, you, we've seen other, his, other examples in the past where, where that has happened, but none of what we're talking about today is actually, has actually happened. There hasn't been that integration of the communities that have been left out in the past. So you really need to be very intentional about your action. And, and not only that, you need to have a dialogue and open up communication, not only with the local community members, that's in the area surrounding the ports, but you also need to go into the schools and, and make sure that you, know, you get into the schools and start getting offshore wind on the, on the radar screen of the K through 12 education program, not just the teachers, but also the students. You know, there, there, are, there are a bunch of these Lego wind turbines. Actually, if you can see it, you can't see it in my background. I have a Lego wind turbine that I built with my daughters, but many schools could have programs you know, where you're doing, you're building a Lego wind turbine you know, in a Lego club or cl a Lego club that someone starts. And, and then you get a chance to start di having a dialogue with the kids about offshore wind. You start getting a, a dialogue about things that they haven't been able to see in the past, right? There's only seven turbines in the entire nation that are offshore at the moment. Many of the kids in some of the, in the communities we're talking about have never seen a turbine, right? So maybe, maybe that's the other thing. We need to start doing programs where we take kids get an opportunity to get out and see the turbines. You know, Block Island is not that terribly far off of, off of Long Island. You know, so maybe there's a way to work out trips and, and, and get, get, you know, raise the consciousness about the opportunities. And then one other thing I just want to address overall is that, you know, there are, there are areas that we know across the economy that have known skills gaps. And what I mean by skills gap, I mean shortage of a supply of people that perform the required work in that field in areas like welding, manufacturing, engineering, and, and these are prevalent within the offshore wind supply chain. You know, there are 16 miles of welds in each offshore wind turbine. It's an extremely important component. So we need to we need to address it and we need to address these gaps as well. And while we're addressing these gaps, incorporate into it education on the offshore wind industry. Great. Um, uh, one of our uh, audience folks, Dan, asks if we could hear a little bit more about um, the specific. Uh, procurement process changes and transformations that um, that uprose. So this question is, is for you, Summer. Um, would be recommending, and if there are pieces that are already in the CLCPA or in the procurement process here in New York, Summer, um, it'd be great to highlight those. But also, if there, you know, the next steps you see as we go forward and keep expanding this industry. And then I'd like to 
to hear from other folks as well on this question. Yeah, I mean, that is a really, that's, that's, that, that's the question, right? <laughs> that's the question, what needs to change? And so I there's definitely a few steps that come before answering that question, right? In terms of there's this, we're in a really unique time where we're all collectively, when we say we're all city, state, federal government, um, and, and all stakeholders, we're in this very unique point of time where we're all on this learning curve together. This is a new industry not just for New York City, not just for New York State, but for the country. And so there are a lot of eyes on what's happening, specifically in the Northeast, where the, where the offshore industry is um, kind of moving and more, more developed than the rest of the country. And so there's a lot of eyes. And so it's so important of what we're doing here in, in New York, in Sunset Park, is a true model for how to be creating innovative partnerships, how to be working and commit, committing to a co-governance model of creating the necessary requirements, the necessary language that are, that are put out in, in these RFPs, these solicitations for offshore wind, how we do that in a very comprehensive way. If the expectation is for the offshore wind industry to have comprehensive economic development opportunities that we need to approach things from a comprehensive framework. And to do that, um, to, to do that, to answer, to go back to the question is to, is to make sure um, that those partnerships are in place before all these decisions are already made that we're, we're taking a step back and we're creating those, those partnerships, we're creating those decision-making um, structures so that, the, so that the input is accountable and transparently integrated within these public processes to, in, to incorporate um, offshore wind power into our electrical grids. Great. Um, uh... And anyone else want to jump in on what you th the sort of next steps in in community engagement and workforce development? Um, and just to slightly broaden the question, uh, one of our, our audience members, um, David, asks about sort of what are the not just next steps for the industry generally, but next steps particularly in, in light of the the pending lease um, auctions for the New York bite area. So we're, you know we're going to see a growth in demand. Are there next steps we need to be doing uh, around the ports? Um, are we are we going to need more than what we've already got sort of on the uh, you know in the pipeline uh, around ports? I don't know. Maybe Ross would turn that to you first, and then Alba. Really, I'd love to hear anyone else who has thoughts. Uh, first, I, one thing that I think that needs to be done is that uh, and and looked forward is New York State. Should uh, you know, New York State's done a great job in building a market so thus far. Really excellent job. They've made great investments in, in ports. They've made great investments in workforce development. Um, they, they've selected some excellent projects as their first projects. But but New York needs to make sure that the market signals are continued and clear for the for project developers and for those that are going to invest in ports and other make other investments. So meaning that they need to have a transparent timeline and time frame for when the upcoming solicitations will occur. And so that everyone knows what ground rules and what it, what it to expect going forward. Um, also, I think you, uh, there's a, a federal budget process that's ongoing right now, and there are some there's some uh, opportunity for workforce development money for an offshore wind to be a part of uh, of a federal budget process. There's also a manufacturing investment tax credit um, uh, for 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 manufacturers of large scale offshore wind uh, uh, components. Uh, the, the, the elected officials in New York State, in New York City, should be reaching out to their federal counterparts in support of these actions, to making sure that there's federal money to back up the, the great money that New York State has already made available for workforce development. Um, and then, and then I, you know, I also think that you know, there is space for additional ports. Um, you know, there's, there is, there is uh, another port, there's other ports under development, including one in, in Staten Island. Um, and as, as we move into 20, 2024, 2025, we're going to see uh, a large amount of construction beginning to happen within the industry. And so there's going to be a, a need for, for a lot of infrastructure to support that. And, and additional ports will be one of those things that are needed. Um, Alba, do you want to touch on that? Um, and 
a sort of related question from one of our audience members, Anne asks, uh, as you think about sort of ports and, and the next step in ports, are there uh, steps that Equinor is looking at for greening the ports that they're going to be using? So not just engaging the communities, but and, and maybe this goes a little bit to, to Willie's um, uh, priority around you know protecting the, the folks that live nearby and, and finding ways to, to make sure that their environment is, is safe and clean. Absolutely. I think Ross is uh, right in the sense of the, the more projects that are coming our way, the, the higher the need becomes to, to have the space for both um, staging and assembly, as well as manufacturing, right? If we're trying to bring uh, jobs to the local communities, to New York, to the state, we're going we're gonna to see an increase in manufacturing at the local level. Um, and then to answer the second question, what I would say is we've, we've been working expeditiously to ensure that we're not just looking at it from a workforce development perspective. Um, we, do, we do need to ensure that we're creating our projects responsibly. And we are in fact looking internally, looking into port electrification. We're looking into sustainability efforts at the port. We're looking into low emissions. And I think what's great about it is, is that we're not just the state, but the city is supporting those efforts and, and allowing us to, to explore the areas that we can enhance at the port level to ensure that the local communities are not negatively affected. We hear this over and over again. We don't want to, we don't want to be that company that has an, a helicopter approach. We show up, develop our project and then we're gone. No, we wanna make sure that the local community, it's not only benefiting from jobs, but they're not seeing the any sort of negative impacts from the projects. So that's something that we that we work um, expeditiously towards. Um, one of our audience members uh, is, is afraid they're asking a stupid question, but it's not. It's a very good and important question, which is, uh, why a port up in Albany? And how are we going to use a port so far away from uh, the, the sea? And really, maybe you could talk a little bit about, uh, you know, the specific, what we already know, and then uh, the, how the port's going to be used. And then another uh, one of our audience members asks about, you know, can we bring things from the west of New York through the canal system or um, down from northern New York? Um, so is the Port of Algonby have a sort of growing future as, as sort of a, a nexus of, uh, of materials for New York? Um, so um, to address the next steps, um, specific, specifically in my community, um, um, Ezra Apprentice is called, a, it's a, designated as an EJ community. Um, if, if we can, <laughs> seriously, I mean, I cannot talk about the Port of Albany without talking about these residents because I've seen the development of uh, comorbidities in that community when it comes to respiratory issues. But when it, when it comes to jobs, we have to really create training programs with the uh, collaboration between the city and the port, um, securing funds specifically, specifically for these training programs. I said to the mayor eight years ago that, um, Whenever there's something going good and we get our young people or people in the community involved, we always have a problem with funds. We run out of funds. So therefore the program is washed away. Um, we have to secure the funds to make sure that our community is moving forward in this whole process with the uh, wind, uh, offshore wind turbines. Um, low income communities has always got the back end of the deal. We can't let that happen anymore. So um, I, I'm, I'm happy to be a part of this process to move this forward, to keep the awareness there, to make sure no one is forgetting about our communities. Um, I've been fighting on the Ezra Apprentice Committee for the last seven to eight years. Um, I've seen healthcare studies come out that, um, that shows that uh, people are dying from asthma. Are not not literally dying, but um, over a long term, yes, cancer is being created right there at, at Ezra Apprentice, right next door to the port. If I was the port with all this great stuff going on, I wouldn't want that negative stigma attached to, to my organization. So we have to do everything we can to uh, move Ezra Apprentice from that um, area. Um, that's my thought on that's that. That's great. Um, does yeah. 
Does anyone else want to maybe Alba or, or Rob sure. talk about the specific uh, use of, of Albany and then the sort of future of Albany? I, I'm going to touch upon the, the question in the sense of uh, explaining where the dots connect between the Port of Albany and the South Brooklyn Marine Terminal. <laughs> um, so what we're looking to do is essentially manufacture towers at the Port of Albany, and we're partnering with Marmon and Welkin to accomplish that. Uh, those components are relatively very, very large components that will need to be then transported on barges down the Hudson to the South Brooklyn Marine Terminal where they will be assembled and staged. So that takes care of answering that part of the question. I'm hoping that that takes away the confusion as to how the two ports connect and really to the offshore wind industry. I was just gonna say water. They connect through water, but, um, but on a more serious, serious note, um, you had asked about efforts to lower the air emissions and, and things at ports. The Business Network's members have taken uh, active steps in that area. Um, one of our members is looking to develop a project in uh, New Jersey, and they are investing in uh, electrifying of the port of Newark um, as one of their steps uh, it, it, as part of bringing clean energy into New Jersey. Uh, and many of our members have uh, sustainability goals or uh, carbon reduction goals in which they're seeking to reduce their uh, greenhouse gases of their supply chain. And that includes the vessels and the operations of the ports. Um, and then finally, we have a, our members that are vessel operators, and they are actively seeking to find alternative fuels from the bunker, the diesel bunker fuels that they're using today, which, as many of you know, are extremely polluting for the for the local communities. And so, um, things that they're looking at uh, green hydrogen and also uh, electrification of the of the ports and, and and vessels in order to help reduce the impacts on local communities as they're building out the industry. Yeah, I think electrification is going to be, uh, you know, of the certainly of all the port vehicles and and operations, and then if we can get to electrification of some of the vessels, that will be um, just a huge step forward. Um, uh, another uh, Marina asks about um, other training programs across New York uh, that are we're either using or seeing as models or actually formally connecting uh, the um, offshore wind industry, um, either in specific communities like the Upper Rose community or the Albany community, um, or, or uh, you know, sort of more generally as we look forward. Anyone wanna talk about models or, or actual programs that we're integrating at this point? Ross? Yeah. Um... So I'm happy to, happy to jump in on that. Um, there's, so there are a few uh, uh, training programs that are occurring. Uh, the National Offshore Wind Training Institute has been uh, developed and established by the state of New York, uh, which is investing $20 million into workforce training. Uh, and that program has put out, uh, so, so out uh, grant applications uh, uh, for, for, uh, for, for training programs that will, um, that will seek to uh, integrate diversity, equity, and inclusion into the into curriculum and training, um, as well as to be doing outreach into local communities surrounding uh, the ports. So they're looking to, to establish the, some of those training programs now. Um, the, you know, in, in a more, more broadly, you know, training is at an early stage here. You know, we only, as I mentioned, I alluded earlier to the Block Island wind farm. There's only seven total offshore wind turbines in the United States right now. Five are at Block Island off the coast of Rhode Island and two are off the coast of Virginia. So we're at the very early stages and, and programs for training are just being, being developed now. Um, there are a number of training programs across the uh, Eastern coast of the United States that are, that are under development and, uh, and, many, and, and several of which are focused on communities, uh, uh, communities surrounding port areas. Um, so there's one in Trade Point Atlantic down in Baltimore. Um, and as I said, New York State is working on, a, on developing some of these programs now and then uh, one other thing I'd be remiss not to, to mention is that labor unions themselves have pre-apprentice training programs uh, in, in, the, uh, in New York State on Long Island, and I believe they're looking to develop one uh, in the Albany region, and those pre-apprentice programs reach out into local communities to help bring uh, people who had, had, had not connected to, to the trades in the past into the trades and providing some upskilling and, and pre-apprentice program and training some math skills, some, some, uh, some, some other soft skills in, in, in then, and then connecting them to the apprenticeship programs. Um, uh, 
Next question, uh, maybe for Summer um, and Willie, uh, if there, do you have examples of the, uh, of other industries that the offshore wind industry could emulate or, um, or, or sort of look to as, as a, a model for how to do this right in terms of community engagement? Honestly, I don't. Um, the Port of Albany is the first uh, um, place I've seen uh, the wind share, offshore wind uh, being built. Uh, we're excited about it. We look forward to working with the port in that particular area, but I'm not uh, familiar with any other uh, areas that's doing it. Yep, that, that was the, my same answer, yeah. <laughs> unfortunately. But, but doesn't mean we can't build it right this time. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, Ross, you said this earlier, but it's the, the opportunity to do this from the ground up is really exciting. And it's um, hearing that from you guys just makes it sort of all that much more important that we figure out how to do this right. It's really uh, very exciting, um, but a little daunting, I'll say. Um, uh, does anyone have any thoughts on the canals? Because that question has come up a few times from our audience. Um, as a I'm way not to stuff from yeah. the west of New York. Yeah, I can't answer the canal specifically. What what can I? What I can say is that Great Lakes provide an upper, a, a, a excellent opportunity for offshore wind development as well. And there actually is a project that uh, is being sought for construction off of uh, Cleveland, Ohio, off of Lake Erie, and there are. Uh, uh, there is interest. Uh, there is interest in developing the Great Lakes more broadly, and so that would present a great opportunity for those the companies in Western New York and the communities in Western New York to connect to the industry. Um, but I think we're also thinking in terms of large components too, right? You're thinking about the the nacelles, the towers, and the blades, and you know maybe maybe those aren't the right pieces. But there's there's tons of and tons of secondary steel opportunities, especially that'll happen out of the Port of Albany, right? Inside those towers, you have ladders and decks and railings and 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 lots of secondary steel that needs to be welded and fabricated on. Those can be produced inland. They can be produced in Buffalo, in Syracuse, uh, in North in the North Country, and then be either trucked or trained down to the, to the location of, of the port in which they would then be fabricated and attached, welded onto uh, the tower or into the towers. Um, I, I just wanna acknowledge that we've got a, a, we've got a lot of questions that have come in now. We've touched on a, a good chunk of them, but not all of them. Um, and uh, we will try to, uh, Niowa and Ace New York will try to post answers to um, as many of them as possible if we don't get to them all today. And that's, that's looking, since we have two minutes now, um, that we probably won't get to the rest of them, unfortunately. But I do want to give folks, a, 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 the panelists, just a last second, if anyone has any last urgent thoughts um, that they want to share, uh, um, give you all a chance. Going once. I, I Really? Yep. I, no, I would like to say, let's keep this process going. You know, it's very educational. It's it's very uh, bringing awareness to the situations that we're dealing with. Um, I, my last word would be being intentional about this process, being intentional about involving, being inclusive, you know what I mean? Um, that's it for me. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank that, you. that is, I think, the, the takeaway message here, a huge amount of potential, but only if we are intentional about it. Sure. Yeah. I love that. And I, that's pretty much, that's what I was going to say is to say being intentional means sharing power. And that's going to yeah. be the foundation of how we build this different. Um, the last two things I wanted to just mention is that in terms of what we, what we need from the city is, um, you know, I mentioned that we've been fighting to preserve the industrial character. Of, of these large industrial waterfronts for projects just like this, you know, to, to meet the state's renewable energy goals, to meet those emission reduction goals and to create hundreds of thousands of well-paid jobs. And we need to do that um, while protect, protecting our sectors. We're seeing developers trying to come in and take or, you know, precious industrial spaces for luxury commercial and residential spaces when they could be used to address climate adaptation, mitigation and equity. Um, and so those, those, those are just the last points I want to leave with. Pablo, last thought? 
Of course, I just want to say thank you once again. Um, it's great. It's been a pleasure. Uh, the questions have been amazing and the audience has been great. If there are any other questions that you want to direct my way, I am open to answering those or facilitating offline conversations with specific groups or individuals. But I, I love the, 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 the emotion and the commitment to intentionality. Um, I jotted down intentionality equity, youth, community, engagement, and collaboration. So let's continue collaboration, the collaboration, let's continue the discussion. These are very important topics. Right on, absolutely. All right, Ross, you get the last word, and then I will take us out. There's nothing I could say to add to what has already been said other than thank you, Willie, for intentionality was a word I had drafted in my notes for today. And thank you for making sure it got out there. Thank you all, I appreciate it. Yeah, thank you, everybody. Thank you to our audience. Really appreciate you uh, taking the time out of your day to join us and, and you, Chena, for, for setting this up and helping uh, co-host it. And to all of our panelists, uh, a great big thank you. It's, uh, it's just so exciting to hear everything you guys are working on and get all your wisdom. Thank you. Thanks so much.